to research civic fathers. Mm. What are their place among many, many fathers that lived in Byzantine, in Rome? What the place of these fathers, civic fathers? Well, <clears throat> I like to see uh, Christian tradition as ha having not just Greek East, Latin West, which is how most people see it, but having three different elements. And the third would be what I call the Syriac Orient. And <clears throat> each of these traditions has its own particular quality um, or emphasis, which the others don't always have. And so each particular emphasis in uh, each of these three traditions is of value to all the others. And that's why I think the Syriac tradition is particularly important. Uh, I mean, if you can put it in very simplistic terms, the Latin tradition is very good on the, the legal side, the canon law side, uh, the Greek tradition on the more philosophical side, and I would say the Syriac tradition is much more on the symbolic and uh, especially the poetic side. Of course, you find in <coughs> Greek and Latin poetry wonderful things which are uh, equally fine, but I think the, as a word, the predominance of uh, poetry as a vehicle for theology is something that the Syriac tradition, especially with St. Ephraim, who beside being a first-class poet, is also a really important theologian. And it's that aspect that I think is absent from, or forgotten, in the other traditions, that theology uh, can be expressed in poetry just as validly as in prose. Can you tell us briefly about the difference between Byzantine Christology, Orthodox Christology, and modern Syriac Christology or Orthodox Christology? Well, as Syriac Christology, there's no single tradition. <coughs> really, one could say that uh, it's historically the case that the Syriac tradition has three different, uh, or it's a transmitter of three different Christological traditions. The Chalcedonian tradition, which of course is the same as the Byzantine tradition, and until the 17th century, Syriac was one of the languages of the Patriarchate, Chalcedonian Patriarchate of Antioch, and that's often forgotten. Uh, so Syriac has a Chalcedonian tradition, um, but then you have the East uh, tradition of the Church of the East and the tradition of the Syrian Orthodox and the other Oriental Orthodox churches. And <clears throat> simply because I've had to read texts of, from all these three traditions, um, I have, I suppose, what you could say the privilege of realizing that once you get underneath what they say on the surface and the verbal conflict, two nature, one nature, and so on, uh, they are all trying to express the same thing, but with different starting points that um, each tradition is afraid of one particular heretical position and so reacts in a certain way. Um, and also in a particular, well, one could say that they belong to a particular theological understanding of certain terms and uh, in particular term hypostasis and uh, physis. Uh, these are terms which are clearly understood in different ways. And once you realize this, you can see how the conflict um, has arisen and also how it should be resolved. And indeed has been resolved by theologians in, in modern uh, dialogue. Um, <clears throat> but unfortunately, that hasn't as well gone further because when you solve the theological problems, you find that the ecclesiological problems. <laughs> uh, but uh, as I see it, basically the Christological problems and uh, the differences uh, are soluble and indeed have been solved uh, in, in modern dialogue. Where in the world, maybe, student, researcher can get the best education, the best um, experience of standing civic fathers? That's a difficult question. <laughs> and um, at any one point, it may be different. At the moment, um, I'm <laughs> here's my chauvinism. I would say Oxford is a very good place. Uh, not because I'm here, but because my successor, David Taylor, 
uh, is very good and he was one of my best students <clears throat> and he has very wide knowledge he's a very good scholar uh, he's very open and um, I think he will go far uh, in a way um, the trouble is in Western academic world is in such a difficult position at the moment in the humanities uh, there's great uncertainty and whole universities don't know what's going to happen to the humanities in this country it's if you ask the vice chancellor he says we don't know we should be uh, the government should tell us what they're going to do we don't know and so everything is uncertain uh, so it's a matter of finding where there are good people, uh, sympathetic people, at a particular time. Uh, France is quite strong at the moment, Italy is quite strong at the moment in certain places, um, Holland, it, but different people have different aspects of interest. So it's a matter of exploring to find where is the best. But uh, what I can say is that Oxford has the only taught master's course uh, in <coughs> Syriac studies and uh, I started this off about 20 years ago and found it extremely useful for getting people really into the subject. We have very intensive reading uh, throughout the year. There's no thesis but uh, um, four exam papers with essays so um, you get a at least I hope people get a good basic knowledge of the tradition so that they can move on to do research in one particular uh, field that they, or author that they choose for. Because <clears throat> there are very few places where you can study Syriac uh, as an undergraduate and it's always as a subsidiary subject, so you're doing it with other things. Uh, so. I, this uh, course, uh, this MA course, Master's Studies in Syriac Studies, uh, it's unique outside India. India has, in Kerala, there's a good place. It's much cheaper than Oxford, <laughs> but the, um, the standard isn't, of course, quite the same. But that, that is another possibility. They have good classes, good people, good library the St. Ephraim Ecumenical Research Institute in Kottayam in Kerala. So these are the only two places in the world at the moment uh, that have uh, a Syriac at a non, not at an elementary level. What can um, a researcher of Syriac fathers give to modern orthodox researcher? Um, I would put it in two ways. Uh, personally, the two great Syriac writers that I um, have learned so much from, uh, one is St. Ephraim, whom I've mentioned, the poet of the fourth century. Um, <clears throat> his theology is, I think, very meanful, meaningful for modern uh, hum, hum, humanity. Uh, he's very ecological in his approach to uh, the relationship between humanity and the world and that that's obviously something very important but he sees it not just on a physical basis of the physical world it's also the he sees the essential uh, <clears throat> as an essential link between uh, humanity and the spiritual um, ecosphere one could say and then the, the other great uh, Syriac writer whom I've learned a great deal from is St. Isaac the Syrian, St. Isaac of Nineveh. So he's a totally different uh, writer from the monastic tradition. And of course he got into Greek quite early on, so he has influenced uh, the Byzantine tradition uh, very profoundly and of course is widely read today. Uh, now what seems to, um, as a way, separate Isaac out from at least many Greek uh, Byzantine monastic writers is that his writing um, in a tradition that's not uh, well this is too strong a word not fettered by the Greek rhetorical tradition um, so he's writing much more, as it were, from a biblical style. Uh, 
even though you will find that Isaac, uh, I mean, if you compare him to the Septuagint, it's very different. But what I'm trying to say is that his approach and the way he puts things is much more, should we say, pictorial in a way. Um, and he works by images uh, rather than concepts. Um, and the, the images, as it were, are vehicles for concepts. And I think that's uh, uh, something that's very much present in, in Ephraim too. But I would say this applies to both of them. Uh, nowadays we can see something like a resurrection of materialistic studies in Russia. Mm. Yes. What can you wish to our researchers what mistakes they should avoid on their ways? That's a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's very important to let the Judge Fathers speak to uh, the researchers and to us today rather than imposing what we think they should say. Uh, that's the first most important thing. It's a responsibility that we have to them. They can't answer back and say that uh, you're wrong <laughs> or we are wrong. So uh, <clears throat> that, I think, is one of the most important things. Uh, I think and such a lot is written about the Church Fathers today in the West. Uh, I would say that it's perhaps more important to read the Church Fathers than to read the secondary literature and be selective in what you read of the se uh, select, uh, secondary literature. And some of it's extremely good, some of it's very illuminating. <clears throat> but uh, one can be bogged down, one can be drowned by it, there's so much of it. Uh, another thing I think would, and this is a great opportunity, there are a lot of important texts which are unpublished. Here's a wonderful chance for make them available. And also very important is to make these texts uh, available um, to ordinary people. It's not something just for scholars. And uh, what I think is one of the wonderful things that St. Vladimir's Seminary Press does, they have this popular patristic series. Uh, these are accessible translations with <coughs> introductions that aren't too technical. They give the essential information and, as it were, act as a, a bridge from today to the ancient writers. And I think this is a very important role for all um, academics who work on patristics, um, because see, these are not, as it were, <laughs> private ancient documents just for us. They're for everyone. And uh, maybe in the form of anthologies or translations of single works, uh, it's a matter of choosing things that are going to speak to a much wider public, and there are plenty of things. So that, I think, would be what I'd suggest. Thank you. Well, not Very at much. all. Thank That's you. Great.